Hello, good morning City Church Prayerfield. Good morning Bakersfield. Let's wave to Bakersfield. We are so glad that you've come to join us today. Deuteronomy 23 says, we are blessed in the city and we shall be blessed in the field. What does that mean? It means we're blessed all throughout. God has been so generous to us and the only thing he asks of us is to worship him, right? So let's get up, let's worship him, let's make some noise. Come on, everyone. Come on, city church. We are blessed. Well, the Bible says, clap your hands, all you people. Come on, put them together. Come on.
Sir! 
presence there's the fullness of joy in his presence there's the fullness of joy never forget that amen because when you step out of his presence you got a problem amen you got a problem so let's always just learn to live in God's presence all we need is him all we need is, and just knowing that he's going to supply all of our needs according to his what his riches and glory amen Trust in the Lord with all our heart. What? Lean not to our own understanding. Amen. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay. It's deposit time. It is deposit time. And it's like, it's like we know right now that God has already made his deposit. And he's going to continue to make his deposit. And what we want to do is just learn how to be obedient and follow. It's just, just, just follow him. Just acknowledge him and follow him, and he's going to direct our path. Amen? So now it's like our hearts and our minds are, are, are prepared. And Father, we, 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 we thank you, Lord. We, 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 we thank you for, for all that you have done and all that you continue to do, Father. It's not about us. It's all about you, Father. Father, we glorify you, we magnify you, Father, and we exalt you, Father. Father, right now we're asking that your Holy Spirit just continue to have his way in this place, Father. And let your Holy Spirit just orchestrate everything that's going to take place today, Father. Father, we're asking that you anoint the word, anoint the man of God, Father. And let us see you in him, Father. Let us hear you speaking through him to us, Father. And Father, right now, we thank you. We ask that you bless this deposit. We give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
from City Church Kid Zone. My name is Jeffrey. We just got tons of reports. Crazy things are happening this weekend. Take it over, Ryder. Yeah, Jeffrey, lots of crazy things are happening. New things every week, carnival stuff happening, clowns everywhere. This is crazy. On to Sonia. We're going to have cotton candy and popcorn, and don't forget to bring a towel, and we're going to have a great swimming time. Woo! So that concludes our City Church Kids Zone news. Make sure to bring a towel, and make sure to come to the church exactly at 1045. I don't know about y'all, but I'm on my way. Mama! Jesus, I need you. Lord Jesus, I want you. I need you all my life. You know, if, if you pray that kind of prayer, you know what happens? He answers it. And I want to talk to you this morning about just that. I want to show you some biblical aspects of what it really means to experience the wealth and the presence of God. Amen? I'm going to start off by having an exercise for the house. I want you to close your eyes and think of the most valuable thing you can think of. I'm not even going to tell you what that might look like. Just think of something valuable. You can open your eyes. Now, some of you are going to think of things like wealth and expensive houses and artworks and things that are worth a lot of money. And some of you are going to think of ideas that you've had or prayers that have been answered or hope that you have. And some of you are going to think of a person in your life who is valuable, maybe a loved one or a child you know. And some of you might think of the Lord Jesus, the most beautiful and valuable person of all. And the reason I have you do this exercise is because we're going to talk about wealth this morning and what value really looks like. I've discovered that a lot of Christians actually don't have a biblical view of what wealth looks like. They don't know that we can actually access the resources of heaven. You might know scriptures that point to that, but I'm going to give you some things this morning that will show you that you are much wealthier than you might think. You are much more powerful than you might give yourself credit for, and you have much more access to the king of kings than you have to any earthly king. Somebody say amen. Now to start off with this, I'm going to compare what the world has to say about wealth versus what scripture has to say. There's a big contrast here, and I want you to catch this because it's important in the life of the believer. So when the world considers what wealth looks like, it thinks about gold and dollars and stocks and bonds and exchange-traded funds and real estate and castles and expensive cars and dinners in posh restaurants, all of these kinds of things. And I was interested in this. I was just kind of curious. We live in America, which is the richest nation on earth. And we live in California, which is the most expensive state in America. And I was just curious to know, what is the most expensive house in California? The most valuable house that's ever been bought or sold? And so I did some, just a little research on this, and I found that there is an eight-acre beach mansion in Malibu that has 40,000 square feet and its own private beach, and it was purchased last year by Beyonce and Jay-Z for $190 million. Now, I just, I thought about that. Wow, that's, that's extraordinary. That number is so large, I can't even think of what that looks like. And yet, there are actually properties that are that expensive. 
And I was continuing to be curious. I was, wanted to know what the most expensive car is that ever sold at auction. And I looked that up, and I found that there was a 1955 Mercedes-Benz 300 SLR coupe prototype. There's only two of these that were ever made. Mercedes-Benz has one in its museum. And the other went for auction two years ago, and it sold for $142 million for a car. I just, when I saw that, I just kind of, I just kind of sat down. It's like, I never thought a car could be worth that kind of money. Or how about the most expensive painting? It turns out that there's a portrait of Jesus that was painted by Leonardo da Vinci called the Salvatore Mundi, the savior of the world. And it actually sold at auction in 2017 for $450 million. Wow. I never knew that these things existed. But I just did a little internet searching, and I found all of this stuff. And then I asked myself, what is the most expensive jewel that's out there? And the answer to that is the Kohinoor diamond, which is part of the British crown jewels. It has never been purchased. It has either been, in its 400-year history, it's either been traded or gifted or stolen. So it has no market value. But we know that if it ever came up for auction based on stones that are smaller than it that have sold, that it would probably sell for billions of dollars. That's a one with nine zeros after it. Now, I tell you all of this because these are examples of what the world considers costly. This is what the world considers valuable. And by the standards of the world, these things definitely are valuable. And in fact, Webster's has a definition for wealth. Webster was himself a Christian. Much of the material that he put in his dictionaries actually came from Scripture. And he said that wealth is the abundance of worldly estate that exceeds the estate of the greater part of the community. In other words, wealth is when you have more than everyone else. And these would all be examples of wealth. This would be extreme wealth. And I tell you all of this because it's hard for the average person to think of what these things actually look like, to imagine that kind of money, that those sorts of stratospheric amounts of cash. But really, I could summarize worldly wealth is that it's all about things and not about a person. I'm going to say that again. Worldly wealth is about things and not about a person. And the interesting thing is, we actually, in the modern world, have lots of different ways of separating ourselves from what wealth really looks like. There's something called the gold standard, which uses the metal gold as a medium of exchange. And so gold is, it's interesting, it's pretty, it's difficult to find, it's hard to mine, it's hard to refine. So it has internal value, but you can't eat it. You can't use it for anything. You can't store up treasure in heaven with gold. And then the whole idea that we have with currency, a piece of paper, shows us that this is now a symbol of gold that I have on deposit with the bankers. So it's a symbol of something that is a symbol of something that's actually valuable. Do you see how far removed that is from actual value? The whole idea that we transact pictures of what we call value shows us how little we really understand about value. So we've actually gone from a place of infinite value to a place of complete worthlessness. And all of this simply because we don't know what true biblical wealth is all about. So I contrast that with God's definition of wealth, which is that it has nothing to do with things and everything to do with God. God defines wealth as himself, and poverty is the lack of himself. Wealth is the ability to experience and enjoy God's blessings and favor 
and poverty is the lack of that. And so a great passage that covers this is found in the biography of King David, 1 Chronicles 29. And the chronicler says this, Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. He's quoting David in one of the times when David is having a personal conversation with the Lord. How many of you know that David had one of the most intimate relationships with God in Scripture? He had a passion for God. He cared about what God said. He cared about what God did. He knew that God answered prayers. He knew that God was the author and the finisher of his faith. He knew all of these things about the Lord, and he passionately pursued the Lord. Conversely, the Lord bestowed endless blessing and wealth on David because that's what happens in relationship. David had a passion for doing God's will, for saying God's words, and as a result, God blessed him for it. And God extended his kingdom. He extended David's influence. He poured out his blessing and favor on David's life. And David was able to see all of these things manifest in his life. And you find that this is true of all the patriarchs. Moses observes that humans are given the ability from God to produce wealth. And he says this in Deuteronomy. He says, But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors, even as it is today. God was always concerned that we would forget his presence in our lives, that we would forget the fact that he led us out of bondage, that he rained down manna from heaven, that he led us into the promised land, that he fulfilled everything he said he would do. That is true wealth. And then, of course, Jesus even tells the parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the pearl of great price. And he says, the kingdom of heaven, this is Matthew 13, 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man finds it, he hides it again. And then in his joy, he goes and he sells everything he has and he buys the field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls when he finds one of great value what does he do he goes away he sells everything buys the pearl jesus lets us know that the thing of greatest worth in our lives is him the kingdom of heaven the place that is being prepared for us that he promised us john 14 if you look it up and so all of these things are examples of biblical wealth. And what I want to do for you this morning is I want to give you a whole bunch of indications of how wealth operates in the kingdom and here as it is in the kingdom, here on earth as well, how wealth is designed to enhance and augment the actions of God on earth. You see, when Jesus said that his sole function, his main passion, was to make sure that he brought the kingdom of heaven to earth, this is how he does it. He invites the Father into everything that he does. He invites us to participate with him and with the Father. And in so doing, God gives us the resources we need to do that. Somebody say amen. This is how it actually operates. And so scripture tells us in a number of ways that God is our sole source of blessing. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, in the world and all who live in it. He founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. If you know from Genesis 1 or from Psalm 104, when you find the reference of he established it on the waters, that's actually a reference to the entire universe, not just the firmament of the earth. What Jesus is saying here is that all of these things have actually access to all of God's creation. And so <clears throat> Hannah 
1 Samuel, remember that she went to the temple to bring Samuel to the temple so that he could be raised in the charge of the priests. And she says this in her beautiful prayer, 1 Samuel 2. She says, the Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. And she goes on, she says, he raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of favor. Does that sound wealthy to you? It sounds wealthy to me. And Hannah knows what this wealth is because she experiences the literal presence of God. So if we remember that wealth from God's standpoint is not just finance, it's not just cattle, it's not just oxen, it's not just things that have intrinsic value, that it's actually his presence. And that when we live our lives in his presence and in his wealth, guess what happens? We experience his presence. We experience his wealth. And it winds up having nothing to do with finance. I'm going to give you some examples of how this works because all of these things literally play forward in our lives. As it is said in Scripture, so it happens in our own lives. And I want you to see how this actually operates in the world. Okay, so one of the misconceptions that we have is that God does not like money. How many of you have heard that God does not like money? He wants his people to be poor. He wants everyone to live in rags and reject value and live without money and still be able to operate in his will. How many of you have actually heard that? I know churches that preach that, and I see a few hands up. Often will say, money is the root of all evil. But that's a misquoting of Scripture. That's not what Scripture says. It doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. And Paul explains this to Timothy in detail where he is simply saying what Jesus said. You cannot serve two masters. It's either God or it's cash. What's it going to be? It can't be both. And so God is our sole source of blessing Everything that he has is ours, and there is so much that he brings to us that, as Jesus says, my cup runs over. And, of course, Jesus is quoting the Torah when he does that. So as God prepared to take the Israelites into the promised land, he constantly reminded them of all of the things they must not forget. You are children of me. You are children of the inheritance. I will be your God. You will be my people. You shall receive blessing from me. You shall be fed by me. You will be fed by the ravens to Elijah. You will be fed by manna to all of you in the wilderness. I am leading you into the place of blessing. That's what God does. And probably quite a few of you have personal testimonies about exactly what that looks like. I can tell a few myself. I've never been without want. I've often been without cash. But I've never gone without meals. I've never not had a place to stay. And my life has not necessarily been straightforward. But quite a few times God has had to stop me and say, is this what I want you to do? I think you know better. And then that correction winds up bringing me into a place of greater intimacy with him, a place of greater wealth with him, a place of greater understanding of his words and his ways. Okay? So God is not against personal wealth. And in fact, if you look at his people... You notice that there are quite a few very rich individuals in his call. I would point out the Genesis that Abraham, Genesis said that Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock, silver, and gold. Genesis also says that Jacob grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and camels and donkeys. These were the currency of the ancient world. Whenever scripture says that these people had a lot of it, they were exceedingly wealthy. 
and this was because they lived in the blessing of God. Solomon is an interesting character. He, scripture says that he was greater in riches and wisdom than all of the other kings of the earth. And the Bible also records what his treasury looks like. It says that he received 666 talents of gold every year. How big is a talent? Well, if you actually do the math, 666 talents is about 25 tons of gold every year. What would that be worth in modern exchange rates? That would be about $4 billion every year to Solomon's treasury. And Solomon used it for God's purposes. And you read the historical books, you see how Solomon used it for God's purposes. And then there's also Job. And Job is recorded as actually having a detailed account in scripture, a spreadsheet, if you will. And scripture says that he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. He was a rich man. This was the, I don't know, Donald Trump of his day. I mean, this guy had a lot of cash, a lot of assets. And of course, as you know, at the end of the story of Job, after he goes through all of his travails, God doubles his wealth and becomes exceedingly prosperous. The end of Job, it actually says 14,000 sheep. All the figures are literally doubled. And it's no different in the New Testament. These are all Old Testament figures. But when you look down, you see that Matthew and Zacchaeus were both followers of Jesus. Guess what? They were both tax collectors. Know something about tax collectors? They tend to be rich. You know why that is? Because they're not necessarily honest with their craft. But Zacchaeus is actually recorded as being seized with remorse and regret for the error of his ways. And he actually says, Lord, look, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody... I will pay him four times what I cheated him. This is a man who has actually had a literal come to Jesus moment. He's recognized that things have to change. I love the fact that Joanna and Susanna are mentioned in the Gospels. Well, who are they? Well, they are people who followed Jesus. They were women who traveled around with the apostles. And Scripture says that Joanna, the wife of Cusa who was the manager of Herod's household, and Susanna were women who helped support Jesus and the apostles out of their own means. And when you read that, it's easy to ignore some of these little things that give us clues about what's actually happening. Out of their own means literally means they have cash that they can spend, and they choose to spend it on Jesus. And in fact... The thing is, if you are married to the caretaker of Herod's household, Herod's a king. How rich do you think Herod is? And how much of that wealth actually comes into you? These people were persons of means. And it's not, again, about the money. It's about what all of these people chose to do with their money. They literally had the resources to help Jesus and they knew that that was the most important thing that you could do. Same thing with Lydia. Lydia was in the city of Thyatira. It says, Scripture says that she was a dealer in purple cloth. Well, if you look into the details of what that means, she's literally running a warehouse that is stocked with fabric and material. And the purple cloth that Scripture talks about was this very expensive cloth that was made from seashells that had a purple dye that actually was quite coveted all around the Mediterranean. So Lydia herself was a person of means. And I love the account that we find in Acts of Lydia because... It actually says that she persuaded Paul and his friends to stay with her while she heard what the gospel was. So she supported the apostles. She was receptive to the gospel. And she literally spent out of her own funds to be able to do this. Okay, so the punchline to all of that is that it may surprise you to discover that Jesus himself 
was wealthy beyond description. Somebody expressed some surprise over that. Most people don't know that that is the case because they always think of what Jesus has to say about foxes have dens and birds have nests. And people always interpret that statement to indicate that Jesus had no place to stay. Well, I would offer you a different interpretation. Jesus spent most of his ministry traveling. And you know that when you travel, it costs money. You have to find places to stay. You have to buy food. You have to buy provisions. How long are your sandals going to work out? You know, last if you're walking from here to there. The Apostle Paul traveled 10,000 miles around the Mediterranean, so I'm sure he went through quite a few provisions. But we know that Jesus was wealthy because at his birth, what happened with the kings? They brought him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Do you know that those three commodities are all extremely expensive? They're very costly items, even in today's society, not just biblical society. And Jesus himself was of the lineage of Abraham, which is, has the favor of God. I already pointed out that Abraham is rich. And since Jesus gave us investment advice all throughout the Gospels, you know that he took that money and he invested it. By the time he was 30 years old and he started his ministry, he probably had a net worth in the millions or tens of millions of dollars. This blows most people's minds, but you can see that it's true because when Joseph and Mary had to flee to Egypt, how are they going to do that? You can't just go down to Egypt and stay there for two years and it's not going to cost you anything. No, absolutely, they had resources to be able to do that. And another thing that we also see in the Gospels is that at the crucifixion, the Roman guards noticed that the tunic that Jesus wore was made of a single piece of cloth. Now, that might be one of those things you don't know exactly what that means. What it means is that in the first century, a tunic made of a single piece of cloth was the Armani suit of the day. It was the most expensive thing you could wear. And you'll notice that the Roman soldiers literally cast lots for it. Scripture says that. The reason they did that was because they knew this was a valuable item of clothing and they all wanted it. So there's those evidences and many more to show that Jesus himself was wealthy. And again, I emphasize that it's not about the dollars. It's not about the silver and gold. It's not about the cattle and all of the details. It's about the resources that God gives us to be able to do the call he has for us. See, God pays child support. Check this out. He literally gave money to his son at his birth. Isn't that the sort of thing that you would expect from a most generous God? I love using the term child support. We don't think of it that way, but that's exactly what it is. God knew what his son was called to do, and he provided for him every step of the way. Now, I tell you all of this because 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 says one of the most famous passages, and that is, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that even though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you would become rich. See, what that really means is that he took all of his wealth, all of his provisions, all of his assets, and he gave it all up for us. I say that again. Gave it all up for us. And that is a gift that you can't ever measure in dollars. You can't. So people read that verse and they say, oh, well, Jesus was, became poor because he was poor. No. He became poor so that all of us could receive his extraordinary gift, his extraordinary wealth, the wealth of eternal life with the ruler of the universe and his father in heaven. 
the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that is the most extraordinary gift we can receive. So, yeah, all of these things suggest to us that there are different ways that God wants us to consider what wealth is. And that in all of this, these are all biblical examples, and they point out to us what's really happening with all of these different things. And so I would point out, here's another insight. Wealth has no correlation with a person's standing with God. Now, the prophet Jeremiah asks the eternal question. He says, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Now, see, we know that some people are, some righteous people are poor, and a lot of wicked people are rich. And Jeremiah wants to know that. And the psalmist wants to know the same thing. He says, Psalm 73, For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So you can't say that all of us don't feel the same way. I mean, it must be nice for Beyonce to be able to pay cash for her huge estate. But I don't begrudge her for that. Because the money that she has is money that she earned. What I do hope is that she and Jay-Z will spend it on the kingdom someday. Because when you have that kind of resource and that kind of ability to reach people, she would actually be an extraordinary witness for the kingdom. And so I actually pray for Beyonce. And I actually pray for a lot of the people who are very wealthy. Because they may not even realize the power that they have with the resources that they've been given. So, Jesus also warns us that wealth should not affect our outlook. And he says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. And the psalmist also says, better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. For the power of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. Okay, so all of these things, I love what Jesus has to say to the church of Smyrna, Revelation 2, 9. And he says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. Point to yourself and say, I am rich. Point to your neighbor and say, you are rich. When you receive Jesus, you become the wealthiest person possible individual in the universe. It's that simple. That's what wealth is. That's what true treasure is all about. And then James says this, the view of the world about wealth is certainly not God's. And he says, listen, my brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith? And to inherit the kingdom to those whom he promised. Inherit the kingdom. The kingdom of God? And we are the inheritors of it? Yes. Just think of what that looks like. Think of the wealth of heaven, which I'm going to mention in just a few minutes because the Bible actually talks about it in depth and gives us some surprising detail about it. So God desires that we view riches from his perspective and not the world's. And Jesus warns in many places that money can be an idol. That's I-D-O-L. That it can be a distraction. That we can spend a lot of time thinking about money and not nearly enough time thinking about our eternal destiny that we cannot serve two masters. In fact, when you look in all of the places where Jesus talks about money, you make a really interesting discovery, which is that he really talks about it a lot, and probably more than most people think. Because, again, we go back to this idea that we have that, oh, well, you know, I, I'm a Christian, I'm righteous, I'm a believer. I'm not supposed to think about money. You know, it, it'll all be taken care of. Well, yes, it will all be taken care of, but that doesn't mean that you live in a state of mental poverty. No, all of these verses that I've just written 
read have actually indicated to us that real wealth is right here, right now. And when we understand exactly how that works, that's when we start to experience God's blessing. And that brings me to principle, another principle, principle five here, if you're taking notes. God wants us to know what true wealth is. It is knowing him. Jeremiah 9 says, This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom. Let not the strong boast of their strength. Let not the rich boast of their wealth. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the exceedingly great understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness in the earth for those in whom I delight, says the Lord. Yeah, thank him for that. You know, when the Father reached down and spoke to Jesus at his baptism, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Do you know that he did the same thing when you got baptized? Did you know that the angels shouted for joy, not just at the creation of the world, but when you became saved? And Paul goes on with this. He writes to the Romans and he says, Oh, the depths of the riches of wisdom. You know, I could stop right there with that verse and just think about the depths of the riches of the wisdom. The wisdom of knowing who God is. The understanding that his judgments are unsearchable and his paths are beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and for him are all things to the glory be to God. Amen. And Paul says this prayer at the end of his long explanation to the Romans of what faith in Christ is is ultimately all about he's always pointing back to the kingdom he's always reminding us that this is where true wealth is really all about and that brings me to another point god's wealth can be invested did you know that did you know that you have gifts scripture says that we all have gifts when we come into the kingdom we are given gifts And 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 and 14 all talk about the operation of the gifts and that everybody gets a gift. Most of the time we get more than one gift. And these gifts, when you actually understand that they are resources that have to do with the wealth of the kingdom, that they become literal wealth when you start exercising them. And again, I'm not talking about dollars. What I'm talking about is the ability to affect God's will in your life here on this earth that he has given you to receive. He's given all of us a call and a destiny. He's given us all an election and a resource. He has invited every one of us to stand in the gap for someone else and be able to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Somebody say amen. That is true wealth. That is what God has for all of us. And so Jesus talks about this. And in the parable of the rich young man, we have this wonderful little interaction where the rich man comes to Jesus asks the basic question, what must I do to be saved? Jesus has answered this question many times, but he looks at this rich man and he realizes that there's an issue here and that this issue has to be dealt with. And so Jesus tells him, go and sell everything you have and give all the money to the poor. Then come back and you can follow me. And you can imagine this guy is not particularly pleased with the Lord, Because it comes at great cost. Why is he going to give up everything? And the rich young man even says this in the story. Everything my father worked to receive, you want me to give it up? 
And Jesus is nodding his head. Yes, you are an example of a person for whom your money has become a crutch, for whom your money has become a source of worship. You can't serve my father and your wealth simultaneously. It's going to be one or the other. What's it going to be? And, of course, we don't know the end of that story because we don't read it in Scripture. All we know is that the young man goes away sad. And I always, when I've read this story, I've always found myself at the end of the story just saying, Lord, I, I pray for that young man. Doesn't matter they lived 2,000 years ago. I'm praying for him now because I want that story to end in the right way. I want the young man to realize that it ain't about dollars, but it is about Jesus. And it's natural for us to have compassion for other people when we see what it is that they face and when we see the obstacles that show up in their lives. And so all of this, all about investments. Jesus tells the parable of the dishonest manager who is a person who is trying to CYA, if you know what I mean. And this particular dishonest manager realizes that an audit is coming his way, and the federales are going to show up. And what he does is he cooks the books. And that's literally what happens. But Jesus points out, if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true wealth? riches and the whole point of that story is not how the money was spent or misspent as the case may be but the fact that the resources the father gives us are to be used by us and to be used by us in a righteous way for the kingdom in the way he intended so that we can be as the workers in the field and so we are, because of that, we are caretakers of God's wealth. He gives us his wealth so that we can use it for him, so that we can increase it for him, so that we can actually bring souls literally into heaven. All of us are charged with doing that. The Great Commission doesn't just apply to the apostles. It applies to all believers. Go into the world and tell the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. That's for all of us. It isn't just for preachers. It isn't just for apostles. It's charged for anyone who has experienced the goodness and the wealth of God. If that's you, your invitation is to become even more blessed by simply telling someone what it is that you know. And because of that, all of us can be evangelists. All of us are witnesses to the goodness of Jesus. And all of us can testify to the beauty of heaven. I want to give you something interesting that I came across when I was preparing this message. You can actually measure the value of heaven using worldly terms. Now, this, this is a surprise. It surprised me until I thought about this, and I realized that all the information is there. I mentioned earlier that the Bible actually has detailed descriptions about the kingdom of heaven. And it says in Revelation 21 that the new Jerusalem and the new heaven is coming down out of heaven to earth, and it is a cube that is 15,000 stadia on one side. Or excuse me, 12,000 stadia. Well, a stadia, after you translate these ancient units into modern units, it's about 1,500 miles. And it also says that everything in heaven is made of gold. And it says that the streets are paved with gold. So just imagine, if you would for a moment, a road that goes from one side of heaven all the way across to the other. This road is 1,500 miles long. It's about 25 feet wide. I went out and actually measured the street that I live on. It's 25 feet. And let's suppose that it has a pavement that is one inch thick. Because when the street comes by and puts down new asphalt, it's about one inch of asphalt that they put on. So if you had a road that was 1,500 miles by 25 feet by one inch, 
and it was all gold. How much gold do you think that would be? I worked it out. All it takes is a calculator. It turns out that it would take hundreds of Beyonce's mansions filled to the ceiling with gold just for one road. And that shows you just how opulent the Father is. One road, you know that the place that Jesus has prepared for you, you know that he is preparing a place for you. He said he's going to his father's house to do just that. So he is building a place for you in heaven. You got to believe that the road that is going to go to your place in heaven is paved with gold. And because it's paved with gold, just using this example, you can imagine just how extravagant the Father is with his wealth. Somebody say amen to that. Yeah, it's, yeah, amen to that. Yeah, it's, it's amazing when you look at these things because the gold itself is not what matters. But God likes gold. And people like gold because it's pretty. It's shiny. You know, it's actually nice to look at. So God uses it as an ornament and a decoration for his domain. And he does that not because we're going to tear up the gold at some point and go spend it somewhere. No, this is how he lives. Our Father in heaven is the most extravagant. He has all of these things that he says and does about wealth. And it is in, invited for us to be able to experience it okay so the bottom line in all of this is that biblical wealth is the creator not the created I'm gonna let that sink in it's the creator not the created and he gives us these things because he loves us he gives us his wealth because he's a good father who shines his light on his creation, who brings storehouses of treasure out of his mansion and brings it to all of us. And so biblical wealth is available to all of us. And so you might find yourself saying, well, yeah, that's fine, Pastor, but you know what? I still got to pay the rent, okay? I still have to have dollars from somewhere because I can't just go down to the grocery store and ask them to give me some food and be able to pay for it with a prayer and a smile. It just doesn't work that way. So I'm going to close by telling you the story of someone who decided to test God on whether or not he answers prayer. Now, raise your hand if you've ever experienced the answer to a prayer that you've had. Yeah, I see quite a few hands. We know what it's like to be able to petition the Lord for something, ask him for a particular thing, and expect that it will happen. And so people can experience this in a lot of different ways. And in fact, God invites us to do just that. The prophet Malachi, verse 3, chapter 3, verse 10, says this, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there won't even be enough room to store it all. Now, I'm reading from Scripture. That's a promise that God makes. And then there's also Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then Paul ends Philippians by saying, May God supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. There was a man by the name of George Mueller who lived in the 19th century, Bristol, England. And he, by his own description, said that he was not particularly righteous in his youth. And he was a partier, and he caroused, and all of this kind of stuff, story that many of us are familiar with. But he went to a prayer meeting at one point, 
And he had a powerful, extraordinary experience with the presence of the Holy Spirit. So he became a Christian on the spot. And he decided after this happened that he was going to pursue the call that he sensed to become a pastor. So he became a pastor. And then one day, he sensed the leading of the Lord that he should open an orphanage for the street children of Bristol, England. He didn't have any money. You don't go into the pastorate because there's cash. So he decided that he was going to ask the Lord for the resources to do the thing that the Lord was asking him to do. So he prayed, and before long, he started receiving donations from people. And some of these people would come up to him, and they'd say, I understand you want to do something about the kids. Well, here's some money. And other people would do it anonymously. He would receive envelopes in the post that had cash inside. And it wasn't long, it was only a couple of weeks, before he had enough money to rent a house. And this wasn't a house that he and his wife lived in. This was a, a house that he rented that's a lot like this church. And before long, he had about 30 or 40 kids living in this house. Now that would have been the end of the story, except he recognized that there really was much more to this call than just taking care of the kids. So, of course, what happened is that it becomes successful, and then his neighbors start to complain because they have all these street kids running around the street. How many of us know what it's like to deal with neighbors? So he goes back to his prayer closet, and he prays again. And he says, Lord, this time I would like enough money to be able to buy a house for these kids. And once again, the money starts coming in. He receives checks in the mail. He gets people coming up to him on the street and just handing him large sums of money. And before long, it's only a couple of months this time, he's literally able to buy a building. And by now, he's able to house a hundred orphans. Now, keep in mind, this is at a time in the mid-19th century where there's no such thing as government support. Okay, there's no Social Security, there's no Section 8, there's no housing assistance, there's no 501c3 that's going to give you a donation, there's no EBT cards, there's none of this. If you're a street kid, you live on the street and you eat garbage. That's it. In fact, the autobiography of George Mueller indicates that Charles Dickens the famous British author actually came to his orphanage at one point because he'd heard some bad reports about it. But Dickens actually came back to London, saw everything that Mueller was doing, and wrote up a good report. And some people say that this was the basis for the story that Dickens probably became the most famous for, Oliver Twist. So Mueller is here, and he is doing all of this simply on the provisions that the father gives him. And by the end of his life, he's actually not just bought buildings, but he's had enough cash to be able to build brand new buildings for these dormitories for the children. And in fact, people have realized that by the end of his life, he had received somewhere around 1.5 million pounds sterling. And if you translate that to American dollars, 19th century to 21st century, it's over $200 million. Just on donations. Just out of the treasury of heaven. Just because the Lord blessed George Mueller wanted him to continue with the task that he was given and wanted him to experience the extraordinary flow from heaven. Towards the end of his life, most of the money that George Mueller received, he gave away. He was in a position where he could start funding other ministries. And when he died, there were 10,000 people who attended his funeral, and quite a few of them were kids that he raised. And it's interesting, too, because 
You might think, oh, well, you know, this is just an interesting, particularly beautiful story from history. But the George Mueller Charitable Trust still exists. And I went to their website, and I found that they now have a global outreach. They've collected millions of pounds every year, and they've now helped over 200,000 kids around the world with education, food, and shelter. And all of this because one man decided to test God at his word and simply take him for real. My father says it, it must be true. How many of you know that God can do exactly this? All this and more if you just live the life of faith. I challenge all of us, no matter what it is that we face in life, you can ask your Father in heaven, and he will be happy to open his storehouse of wealth and pour it into your life. I've done this myself. I don't know how many times I've looked at my finances and I've said, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know that it will happen. And that is what faith is all about. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I just thank you right now for your presence in this house. And Lord, I just ask that you would come down into the souls of my brothers and sisters and every person here today who is facing something they can't deal with. Remind them that true wealth is given from you that you take care of your kids that you love your children that you are the good father who opens up his wallet and has pictures of every one of us in it and takes care of us in ways we can't even imagine that you send angels down to us in our times of need that you bring us comfort and restoration that you actually solve our problems even before we know that they're solved because you love us so much. And you can do that in the mighty name of Christ Jesus.